Good evening, folks, and welcome to Wings of Faith Ministries, Sunday evening's thoughts from the Word. And we would like to remind you here at Wings of Faith that if you have a prayer request, please uh, get on wingsoffaith.ca, share it with us, and we'd certainly be more than happy to stand with you in prayer. Also, if these messages are a blessing to you, we pray that you would like them or share them with your friends and we would be most appreciative of that. And once again, we want to thank you for welcoming us into your homes or wherever you may be viewing this in the coming days. We want to uh, go to the book of uh, Judges, which is the seventh book of the Old Testament, and we're going to start with our text there. But before I do, I want to talk tonight about the times that we live in. And uh, we know the last two years has certainly been a trial for all of us. I was looking yesterday at some of the statistics. Uh, here in Canada, over 32,000 have died. 10,000 here in Ontario. And here in Lambton County, over 100 people have died of COVID. So these have been very sad times. They've been times of a lot of anxiety economic and social stress. And the question is going to be asked, and it's a very fair question, where is God in all this? Where is Christ in all this? And that's what I'd like to talk to you tonight about. Where is Christ in our dilemmas? And so we want to turn to the book of Judges, chapter 2, and we're going to begin at verse number 6. Judges chapter 2, and beginning at verse 6. If you have a Bible or a device in which you can access the scriptures, uh, please follow along. Verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the Israelites all went to their own inheritance to take possession of the land. The people worshipped the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. So they buried him within the bounds of his inheritance at Tamath Ayers in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Moreover, that whole generation was gathered to their ancestors, and another generation grew up after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and started worshiping the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were all around them and bowed down to them and provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord, and they worshipped Baal and Astartes. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them to the power of their enemies all around, so they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them to bring misfortune as the Lord had warned them and sworn to them, and they were in great distress. <clears throat> then we want to go to the next book, the eighth book of the Bible, the book of Ruth. And we want to begin at chapter 1 and verse 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Balon and Chilion, and they were Ephraimites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left there with her two sons. They took Moabite wives, the name of one was Orpa, the name of the other Ruth. And when they had lived about ten years, 
Both Malon and Chilion also died, and the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. And then finally, to the final chapter of the book of Ruth, chapter 4, and beginning at verse number 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When they came together, the Lord made her conceive, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a next of kin. May his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her bosom, and became his nurse. The women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed, and he became the father of Jesse, the father of King David. From about 1300 BCE until about 1100 BCE or 1050 BCE, the nation of Israel uh, was, to say the least, a tumultuous place to live. They had had 12 leaders in this time span rise up, and they needed these leaders to simply deliver them from all the calamities that they found themselves getting into. They had famines, they had wars against uh, people on all sides. They were plundered by those people. They went and turned against themselves, one tribe against another tribe, and created genocide within their own country. They had mass murder, uh, all sorts of terrible occurrences in this 250 to 300 year period. And these leaders would rise up and bring somewhat of a deliverance, and there might be peace in the land for 10 or 20 years, but this vicious cycle would repeat itself constantly. So it was a very tumultuous time, a time of chaos, and one of the writers uh, in the book of Judges said it was a time when everyone just did what was right in his own eyes. There was no moral compass in the land whatsoever. And it's during this backdrop, <clears throat> this time period, that we have the story of this family that lived just outside uh, the little town of Bethlehem. And I believe this story is probably one of the most heart-wrenching stories in the entire Bible. But it does have, and that's what we want to focus on, a glorious ending. We have a family, Elimelech, Naomi, and two sons, Malon and Chilion. There is a famine that has gone on now for close to three years. While one year famine can be devastating to subsistence farmers, but this one had gone on quite a long time, and so people are now desperate. And Elimelech and his family are so desperate that he decides that he's going to give up his land rights and his inheritance rights in Bethlehem, and he's going to move across the Jordan River to the east and settle in Moab, which were really traditional enemies of the Israelites, to try and eke out a living in the plains of Moab. And so he, his wife Naomi, and the two boys head over to Moab. We are told that they are there for 10 years. And in this 10 years span, the two boys marry two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. We are also told that tragedy strikes the family while they're in Moab. Naomi loses her husband. And then on top of that, she lost both her boys. One has to wonder if it was some type of genetic disease. We're not told. All we know is, is that all the male members of the family died in that 10-year period. 
What you need to know when it comes to the ancient culture was it was a very patriarch, patriarchal society and a patrilineal society, which meant that it was male dominated and all property and goods were transferred through the male line. So we have these three women, Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah, who now are left with nothing. No property, no future, no husbands, and no real hope for any type of future. And so it's on the plains of Moab that these three women, totally marginalized now in society, have to make some tough choices. I don't think you can really get much more destitute than these three women were. And yet, in the midst of that situation, the Spirit of God is there. As they make these choices, Orpah decides that she will return to her native country, go back to her family, and try to hope for a living there. Naomi fully expects that Ruth will follow the other woman and go back to her home. But it's there that somehow the Spirit of God works and Ruth says, no, I'm going to go with you. Your people are going to become my people and your God is going to become my God. Naomi, I think, would think this was a, a wild and unrealistic choice because I'm sure she felt that Yahweh had all but abandoned her with the destitute situation she was in. But Ruth has made a decision. She wants to go west, cross back the Jordan River, go back to Bethlehem with Naomi, and try and make a living there, and make Yahweh her God. And so the two women return to Bethlehem, and it says that when the town saw them, the whole town was stirred. Now, Bethlehem would not have been a big place, maybe somewhere between 250 to 350 people. But the town is stirred when they see these two women come back, knowing now that they have nothing. And so, as they settle into Bethlehem, Ruth decides that she must work if they're going to support both her mother-in-law and herself. And so she decides that she's going to go out and glean during the Israelite barley harvest. And once again, in the middle of all this, uh, what you would call hopeless situation, the Spirit of God is there. Ruth chooses a field to glean in. She didn't know who owned that field. She probably had no idea. But she chooses a field in which to glean in, and she's going to be the only woman in that field that is gleaning. It's going to be all men. And yet God is there with her, protecting her. What is so great about this story is that the field that she chooses to glean in happens to be one that is owned by Naomi's relative. Ruth has no idea that that's the case. So she comes home with her pickings from gleaning and tells Naomi about what she's taken in. But more than that, she tells him that she worked in the field of Boaz. Boaz was Naomi's relative, and Naomi must have just had joy in her heart to know that somehow Ruth found this particular field to work in. And so Ruth goes back, and the landowner, Boaz, finds out that Ruth is working in these fields, and he gives her protection, but he also gives her favor. He it just is totally in total awe of this woman and how she has been faithful to her mother-in-law and is out here working in the fields in the hot sun, trying to glean enough to support both herself and her mother-in-law. And so in this story, we find that even in the most destitute of times, the Spirit of God is at work. It turns out that Boaz ends up marrying Ruth. And so... They come, and, and after the marriage, there is a son born. The people of Bethlehem are, are uh, joyful, the scripture says, and they give this young baby the name 
Obed. And we can see here that the Spirit of God, even in the most destitute of times, was working all along. Because we find out that this young baby, Obed, will become the grandfather of King David. Little did these two women know when they were in the plains of Moab with nothing, no hope, no goods, no future, that all along these two women would be catalysts for not only their own family, but for the entire nation of Israel. Because through the events of their lives, a great monarch would arise who would lead Israel to its most glorious days and who would be the descendant of Israel's Messiah, Jesus Christ. The other fact that I want to leave with you is the, the concept of the Redeemer. It is a term that is very, very common or was very common in the Middle East. It is the first time we hear of it in the Bible. And it's when someone steps up to the plate and redeems. And that's exactly what Boaz did for Ruth and for his relative Naomi. When he saw Ruth working, he made it his goal to come up to the plate and redeem back the land for his relative Naomi and for her daughter-in-law Ruth. And when he redeemed that land, he also took Ruth as his wife. So we have the first concept of the Redeemer in the Bible, a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ would do for us and become our Redeemer. We had no hope. We had no future. But like Boaz, Christ stepped up to the plate for us and became our Redeemer. And so this is a wonderful story of how in the most destitute of times, Christ is right there, the Spirit of God is right there working. And I'd like to leave that thought with you. You could have suffered, uh, be, in, or be in some anxiety, you could have suffered loss, but I want you to know tonight that no matter what situation you find yourself in, the Spirit of God is there with you. It's not the end of the situation, Christ always has a future. And if you're listening to me tonight and you find yourself in a situation uh, comparable, maybe, to that of uh, Naomi and Ruth, I want you to know that in the most dire situation, the Spirit of God is there. And so as we close tonight I, and we pray, I'd just like you to uh, lift your heart with me to the Lord and ask Him to undertake in your situation. Christ is your Redeemer. Christ is your Restorer. Christ is there always to give you a future. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just lift our hearts to you tonight. Lord, we have talked about one of the most heart-wrenching stories in the Bible. And yet, in these women's darkest time, you were there. You were working. You were there in the plains of Moab when Ruth decided to return to Israel with her mother-in-law. You were there when she chose the field that she would work in. And you were there when Boaz stepped up to the plate to become a kinsman redeemer for both Ruth and the mother-in-law Naomi. And I just ask that those who are viewing this tonight and in the next few days, that whatever situation they find themselves in, no matter how dark or no matter how abandoned they might feel, Lord, that you'll be there with them, that you would let them know you're there in the situation and that you can bring a fine ending to that dilemma in their life. We ask for hope. We ask for confidence. We ask for faith tonight in Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. We wish you the best. Have a good week, and we'll see you next week.